Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to have Bernard Chazelle today, who's going to be talking about uh, an algorithmic toolkit for out of equilibrium systems. So Bernard, as many of you know, him personally uh, uh, graduated from Yale. He did his PhD here at Yale and has been a professor in Princeton since 1986, where he holds the UD and Higgins Chair in Computer Science. Um, he has held many positions all across the world. Um, among his awards, he's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the European Academy of Sciences, an ACM Fellow, a Guggenheim Fellow, and several Best Paper Awards from the SIAM Mathematical Society. Uh, perhaps something that uh, um, uh, really strikes a chord uh, with me personally is the fact that Bernard uh, invented this uh, integrated science program at Princeton University and has been looking at uh, the world of natural algorithms through the lens of computation. And I think his talk today will be uh, an example of uh, that. So, so without any further ado, uh, Bernard Chazelle. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Nishit, for your very kind introduction. And thank you, everybody, for, for coming and for being around. If, if there's any problem with the audio, uh, be kind enough to tell me now and I try to adjust it. But I, if I don't hear anything, then presumably it's OK. Uh, I was really looking forward to visiting you. I mean, this, um, this thing was arranged many months ago before COVID. And, um, it's a very special place for me. I mean, she mentioned that I was a student there, and uh, but I was this odd student who actually had a great time. I mean, usually grad students are not terribly fun. I mean, people are not terribly fun of the grad, uh, the, the grad uh, graduate school years, but I was, but I am, and uh, so I always go, love to go back to New Haven, uh, go to York side, uh, even though even though uh, the loss of Naples. It's something probably Yale never recovered from, but I understand there are other venues to eat good food there. All right, uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, what I like to do. Uh, it's gonna be a very informal, non-technical talk, uh, as I said, uh, and so I'd like to cover maybe less material and you know, have more of a conversation about it rather than going into the you know, mathematical uh, uh, side of things. Okay, um, so actually let me start with the story. Uh, so I, I got into this by accident. So I was just reading random stuff. And, and then I read about this fellow, Fred Bartlett. He was a psychologist in England way back in 1932. And, and he had the following ex experiment. He asked students to come to his office uh, to take a test and uh, Quickly, here are the conditions of the test. Um, the students would come just one at a time to his office, and they were not allowed to talk afterwards to the other students. This is very important, you'll, you, you'll see why. Now, when they were in the office, then uh, Mr. Professor Bartlett would show, oh, sorry, I have trouble. Okay, that's what he would show. He would show this drawing of an owl to the student. And he would show it for about one minute and then he would hide the drawing and he would ask the student to reproduce from memory what he or she just saw. And so it was draw. And then he would ask the student to leave, not to talk. And he would usher in the next student into his office. And he would show the second student the result, the drawing of the first student. So he would not show the original I have a question actually. Do you see my cursor when I go like this? Yeah, okay, great. So, so, so he would not see the first one. He would just see the, the drawing of the, second, of, of the first student. And then same thing. After one minute, he'd be asked to reproduce it the best he could or she could, uh, and so on and so forth. So these are the actual pictures that I'm showing you. Uh, I scanned them, okay? And so it goes... <laughs> It goes into a cat. I mean, I mean, there's several str strange things uh, here. First, it goes from an owl to a cat, and, and this has been repeated over and over again. It goes to a cat, no question. And but also notice how the tail, uh, the tail is on the left. I'm not sure why there's a tail going to the left, but then it switches to the right, right here, and then it's it's stable, and that's it. Once it's like a phase transition, it's just not going back. Okay. So anyway, so. So owls go to cats, why? Big, big psychological question. 
So uh, 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 Kalish and Griffiths at Berkeley some time back uh, look at this and try to understand what was going on. And they quickly realized as uh, expert psychologists and cognitive scientists that this was impossible to figure it out. It's just too complicated. Uh, so they try to simplify uh, this, the experiment and they had this model where uh, it went roughly like this. So it's a Bayesian model. There's a teacher here represented drawing the owl. And then the first student can sample data from, from the owl, from the teacher, and then forms a hypothesis as to what it is that they just saw. And then she will uh, be able to provide data to the next. So the teacher, the student becomes the teacher and the next student will be able to sample data from this person and form a hypothesis. And this will just go on like that. And what they showed is that in some Bayesian model, uh, this is a form of Gibbs sampling and it mixes to the prior. So the, the, the concept would be that uh, your prior is a cat. When you see some small animal that's kind of cute, but it's gotta be a cat. And so it starts being an owl, but your prior takes over and eventually for, forget all about the owl and it becomes a cat. All right, that's interesting. Um, so now a, a quick word on the motivation. Actually, these people were not interested in owls and cats, but they were interested in language, in particular how language evolves and how, oh yeah, how can a language evolve if the, if the attraction to fire is so strong? Okay, so imagine that you go to, um, let's say you're a native English speaker, like, like I'm not, uh, and you go to China and you teach English maybe for a random student for six months. Right? And then that person, uh, based on what they've learned from you for six months, then goes off and in China and, and teaches English to another random student and so on. You know, so, so the theory says that after a while, uh, then these uh, Chinese people will be teaching e each other Chinese, that, uh, that English will have been totally expunged from the system. So if that's true, then how can language evolve? The, the prior just always brings you back. All right, so that, anyway, that's what they wanted to study, but that's not really what I'm interested in. Uh, what I'm interested in, I, I, I will um, uh, um, get to by saying a few brief words about the experiment that they, that they conducted uh, these people with an extra co-author, uh, Lewandowski. Um, so they did the same with, uh, but just a simpler version of the owl versus cat. They, they started with a cloud of points that clearly samples a descending line, like y equals y minus x or something like that. All right, so they didn't draw the line, they would just draw the the dots, and then they would show that to the students. Now, to be fair, they didn't quite show the picture. It, it, it's more clever than that. It was in the way of a video game, and there's no point going into the specifics of the video game that they designed, but, but roughly it's the same idea that they would uh, repeat the experiment with this line uh, going down, being sampled by points. Uh, and then they would observe and very quickly, in fewer than nine iterations, then they saw that, that it would be the same, except now the line was like y equals x, or something. Just, it would be going up. And so, I mean, it's equally weird. I mean, I guess there's a prior that people are optimistic. I mean, this was in Berkeley, so maybe, who knows, maybe they're very happy there. And so, you know, all lines have to go up for some reason. And so, so, so that's their prior. And uh, so that's the experiment um, with undergrads. So maybe the, it's different if you try with older people. But uh, um, so what was happening here was a random process that kind of starts in some, some particular configuration and then quickly forget about it and goes back to uh, sort of the bottom of the well where you know, uh, energy is minimal and, and, and it's happy there in equilibrium. So the, the question we ask with a former student of mine, Chu Wang, is uh, how can we change that? Um, I mean, what would you have to do in order to make sure this does not go back, a drift back to the prior? So one intuitive idea would be, let's say to go back to the Chinese, uh, you know, being taught English, would be to increase the length of the teaching session. So instead of six months, six months, six months, maybe it's gonna be six months plus one day, six months plus two days, six months plus three days, 
and see what happens. And uh, sure enough, uh, we show that if you increase by, lo by, by really small amounts, a logarithmic growth. Um, so again, this is not gonna be a technical talk, so I don't wanna get into the formula and stuff like that. But I think the, the concept is rather simple and fairly intuitive that if you increase uh, length uh, of the um, teaching sessions time, then the drift will, uh, will be compensated uh, somehow. And in fact, you can show that that this sort of iterated, uh, iterated learning does not lose any knowledge. And so you can you measure the distance between languages that you are learning, and you can show that uh, uh, this will, um, you'll be able to teach English in perpetuity uh, forever um, for any uh, distance epsilon. So I'm, I'm wrestling with, okay. Um, but here's the thing. So sustained iterated learning requires keeping the system out of equilibrium. I mean, a nice way of looking at this is, you know, so you're in the world of Markov chains, which I drew here by having this graph. And uh, I assume you're all more or less familiar with this idea. So you've got this probability distribution over the nodes uh, and um, maybe that's your starting distribution. And so there's information there because maybe all the information, all the distribution is concentrated on one one node, and so that's the, the so it's like uh, the owl. Uh, but then you start walking around at random, and you kind of go to the stationary distribution. That's your equilibrium. So the idea would be to change this Markov chain every time you take a step, so in order to somehow prevent mixing. So now it's you know it's ninety nine percent of all the work on Markov chain has been. How do we get this to mix quick, fast mixing, you know, torpid mixing, we hate that. Uh, quick mixing, we love that. But here is the opposite. It's that we actually want to prevent equilibrium. We want to stay away from that. And so the, the main theme of this uh, talk will be, um, there'll be two points. One is that to worry about staying away from equilibrium is very important for computer scientists and others. To, to look at. And, and the second is somehow, I don't think we, we have the right techniques and mathematical techniques to, um, to attack these problems. Um, so, so yeah, so what I wanna say here is that, uh, I mean, it's a truism to say that the, the theory of Markov chain uh, is old and it's very rich. There, there are lots of great results, but there's also lots of great techniques. And, um, and you're, many of you are, world experts, so I'm not going to teach you that. That's, uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's a beautiful, lovely um, area of probability theory. Um, and um, if you're not convinced by it, uh, let me just uh, quote uh, the great physicist Leonard uh, Susskind, who says that the whole field of statistical mechanics is really a subset of probability theory. It's actually a subset of the theory of Markov chains. And um, so, so these random processes that try to go to equilibrium is extremely important in, in physics and chemistry and all sorts of things uh, for, I think, clear reasons. But more important, it, it's very rich in technique. Lots of, lots of uh, hammers and screwdrivers and all sorts of things. Now, when you, but life is different, okay? L uh, equilibrium in life means death. I mean, basically, if you have a Markov chain and you, you don't inject energy into it, this is, this is going to be chem, you know, chemical soup and uh, you don't want this. And so now this would be a different target. Don't really want to go into this. But still, briefly, any living process is something that has to sort of tr uh, convert energy. Uh, so you, typically, you would take free energy, so energy that is uh, that, that, that you can use and you, you can do things with it, um, but also in the form of matter and nutrients and stuff like that. And then there's a natural algorithm. So there's some, some sort of algorithm. And I insist on the word algorithm because it's not just like a, a process of bio, you know, chemical process. The, the word algorithm suggests that there's memory in the system at all time, at different time scales. And, and this is very important. This is really one of the main thing that distinguishes biology from physics is the importance of history and memory in biology. And then uh, this produces work, which changes the nature of things, and it produces entropy. I mean, there's conservation of energy, so you know, it has to go somewhere. 
Uh, and Jeremy England has a, is a biophysicist. He has a very nice theory about how uh, the whole purpose of evolution is, um, is, is to increase irreversibility, that this process should be as irreversible as possible. Um, it's, um, it's cool stuff. But, um, and, um, but at least I think at the conceptual level, I, I, I think it's, it's important to, 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 to see how this distinguishes um, life completely from, from sort of more traditional physics-based uh, random processes. Okay, um, let's switch to something different. Uh, exploring the same theme of life out of equilibrium. So appearing dynamics is, um, is really- uh, cool. Can I ask a question? Of course, yes. Uh, so is like uh, Markov chain the only way to think about equilibrium? Oh, no, 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 right. I mean, there are, um, I mean, I don't see, um, I mean, I guess you can always, I mean, there's so universality, you can always kind of model almost anything you want to mark out chain when there's no energy, but, but that wouldn't be the wrong thing to do. I mean, in, in mechanics, for example, in the standard Newtonian mechanics, I mean, sometimes it's, it's so deterministic, there's no point really having any sort of randomness into the process, so yeah. No, I mean, if you want to go to the moon, it's probably not a good idea to think of it as a Markov process. Uh, so, um, yeah, so what is this picture here? So imagine, so this is a model that political scientists like, or I mean, I just, uh, it's not my model, and it's, uh, but it's kind of interesting because, so you have these people, we call them agents, and we'll represent them by points here in the plane, but they could be in higher space. And so, you know, left and right and authoritarian, libertarian. So you can be almost anything, you can be on the left, you could be on the right, you could be on the left, sort of a Stalinist, or you could be on the left, just let people do whatever they want, you know. And um, anyway, uh, so what people might want to know is how through interactions, these people will change their minds, or maybe they won't, but, uh, uh, but they change their mind by talking to each other and being influenced by others. But the novelty of the model is not to say that you're influenced by whatever talks to you, uh, but you're influenced by what talks to you, but also resonates with you. So people who are probably not 100% different. I mean, you could hear some raving lunatic on the radio all day long, and you, but it's unlikely that person would influence you very much because you, you, you would dismiss that person as a lunatic. And, uh, but if so, a very trusted friend or colleague of yours thinks that you're wrong about this political view, you're, you're more likely to actually pay attention to it and say, well, let's see, maybe I'm wrong, you know, let's hear your argument. Anyway, that's the point. So, so now if uh, you wanna cast this into mathematics, so your agents have become points in this plane and here you have 20,000, so a large number. Uh, and um, so in this, uh, so the many, many different variants of the model, but in the original uh, so-called hexagon krausen model, what happens is each agent will, will behave in a very similar fashion. So here the agent will look at a fixed radius. So there'd be some magical radius and let's just assume it's the same radius for everybody. It doesn't have to be, but let's just assume that. Um, so here the center of this circle what happens is this agent will look at all these other agents within that red disk, and then it will move to its center of, of gravity of all these guys. So the idea is that it's kind of, it, it trusts and it listens to all these different opinions, but they're not so different. They are within a certain radius. But some of these might be contradictory. Some are pushing toward authoritarian, some are pushing down toward libertarian, so they try to get some kind of compromise, uh, and uh, it's uh, and just moves to to, to that uh, position. You could put weights also. Maybe you trust some people more than others, and so on. You can imagine all these different variants. Um, uh, but the point of this model, or at least from my point of view, is not so much to answer deep questions about political science or sociology. I mean, that's not my expertise at all. Um, but but it's to see whether there's any clever, I mean, it, it, 
is there any cleverness into this business or is just we just rely on intuition or are there any is there any mathematics that can help us uh, uh, do this thing and then we can worry later whether it's it's useful or not but um, um, so <clears throat> now if you look at this picture and you start from a sort of uniform like uh, Poisson process then then you start having these different uh, sort of dimension reduction where you start having this Voronoi diagram like things so from two dimensions to one to two dimensions to one dimension and then finally um, the zero dimension uh, things will converge into clusters. Uh, now, there are tons of results. So I, I've worked on this with some collaborators, but, but there's a large body um, of work by many people. Um, and it's a, it, it's a very nice uh, body of literature and all kinds of results, all kinds of open problems. It's a lot of fun. And so you can show that, for example, this process will always converge in polynomial time and have the balance have improved from year to year and stuff like that. It's a lot of fun. Um, but, but one has to admit, however, that all the proof techniques are, are classical. Uh, they're, they're classical combinatorics. Uh, it's almost an oxymoron because in, in combinatorics, it seems almost every proof is sui generis. It's almost like, you know, it's um, like there's a clever commentarial argument and they all look different. But still they proceed through the same sort of combinatorial approach. You don't have a sense that you're bringing some kind of a major weapon into this battle and then you just get the weapon and, you, and then you get it. It's all like tiny miracles that happen and eventually you get to the result. You, you don't quite know how you got there it's um and that's a bit unsatisfactory right because um it began nice to 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 know that and there's so many different questions if every time you ask a new question you have to spend another six months of trying to find those magical tricks it's <laughs> that's just not the way you build a new science okay so so are there any sort of mathematical principles behind this that we could use and when i say principles i don't really mean conceptual principles i i, I mean tools uh, analytical tools, um, and um, or we just do old math. So uh, there is a really intriguing conjecture by these three fellows from MIT, um, which uh, which puts into mathematics something that was observed by many people by running experiments. And so, so this is the same model, but instead of being in two dimensions, it's in uh, it's in one dimension. So it's on the left here. So you imagine there are lots of points from here to here, and there are so many of them, it looks like a, like a vertical line because there are lots of points, but these are discrete points. Um, and they're uniformly distributed. Maybe they're random, but it's uniformly uh, distributed. And there's so many of them, it looks like all filled with blue stuff. And then you just let it go. So there's, so instead of circles, now what you have are intervals. And so there's a magic uh, radius R and you basically go to the center of uh, gravity of your neighbors within distance r up and down and everybody does the same thing and, just, and you just go and it looks like this so they all converge into clusters but you notice the the distance between the clusters is like so this is 2r this is a bit bigger than 2r and you know stuff like that so the conjecture it's called the 2r conjecture um, it's never 2R anyway, but 2R is just a nice, uh, I mean, you can say the 2.31567 conjecture. So, so uh, it's called the 2R conjecture, but, but it's, they, they, they don't mean 2R, literally. Um, when you do the experiments, uh, simulation, it's more like 2.3. So it's a weird number. <laughs> and um, they were trying to prove that. And, um, and, we, we tried hard and we failed hard. <laughs> so we, we, we just couldn't. Um, now, because we're on our own, I mean, basically you're just still looking at the problem and you try to, you know, do what you got to do. You try things out, try ideas and, and so on. But, but it's like you're fighting this battle on your own. I mean, when I say on your own, I don't, it's, it's not just me, you know, your friends, your, your collaborators, your, your community. Um, so, we thought, wait, maybe people have looked at some um, some news version of this. 
So there are many ways you can cheat. I shouldn't use the word cheat, but you know, so instead of having a finite number of agents, you can imagine you have an infinite number of agents. That taking this so-called thermodynamic limit, it's not entirely kosher, but in physics it's done all the time. And there, as we'll see, there are plenty of good reasons to do that. And even though it's not realistic to have an infinite, but but perhaps it, it's instructive. You 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 can learn something. Uh, so you take the number n to infinity, the number of agents to infinity. You also make time continuous. So this is, think of it as making it, making it discrete, but the, the time steps are, are very, very small. Um, that's also a little bit cheating, but, uh, you know, and, um, and uh, so now you have, uh, you have to think in terms of density because there's too many agents. There's an infinite number of them, so it doesn't make any sense to talk about their location. So you have to talk about uh, the density of, of agents over time as it evolves. So these uh, mathematicians, these three mathematicians here <clears throat> at the bottom actually worked on this and, and they formulated a, you know, a nice mathematical you know, uh, PD, uh, it's called a Fokker Planck. It's a family, Fokker Planck is a family of PDEs that's a very, um, that's uh, very popular in physics, statistical physics and mechanics, it has to do with transport and stuff like that. So anyway, that's what you do now. <clears throat> oh, there's one more thing that I should say, which I think is very important, which is missing from the original uh, two R, in the two R conjecture, the original points, the points at time zero are placed randomly. But after that, it's entirely de deterministic. And to some extent, that's gonna make you, your life too complicated because you see in intuitively when you look at what's going on after a long time um, you're not interested in pathologies I mean there's always some kind of weird case out there it's very nice to be able to say that no, no this is not going to happen but the only randomness is at the very beginning so it could be really really tricky because it's highly nonlinear that somehow you can explore exploit the fact that at the beginning there's something random so that should exclude pathologies but that will be retained throughout you know, all time. Um, so instead, we are going to inject a little bit of stochasticity all along. So every time you do this averaging, you perturb a little Brownian motion there. So this is this diffusion term over here, rho xx, uh, that you add. Uh, this is, of course, this this step is extremely common uh, when people for people who work in PDEs. They're just beyond. In, this is the obvious thing to do. But but for people like us in algorithms. It's not exactly the first uh, step we uh, think of because it seems that you're gonna make things only more complicated, not less complicated. And here that's not true. So um, so actually what we showed with uh, Lee Win and E, uh, Lee is from Beijing, Win and E is from Princeton and uh, my uh, student. So I was clever to be joined by, by world-class experts in PDEs. It was, uh, it made me discover all, all, all sorts of new mathematics uh, that's incredibly powerful. And so actually we proved, we proved the conjecture. We actually got the constant 2.29. It's, uh, it's a weird number. It's, so, it's almost certainly transcendental. I mean, it's not, it's a solution of a weird tri uh, trigonometric um, equation. And all this is done by using very powerful techniques from harmonic analysis that, that experts in PDEs oh, you know, which I'm not, I'm not. and um, but for them, that's the bread and butter. And the reason I, I bring that up is this incredible gap, because now we're able to, to, to make use, we were not on our own, we could tap into a very rich body of techniques and actually get somewhere. And, uh, and plus we can interpret these numbers I mean, once you go into these sort of Fourier modes, then you can start seeing the, the, the dynamic role of each, of each term. There's a whole story, mathematical story, you can tell. Whereas in a discrete case, again, not only you're on your own, but there's no story to tell. You just do the math and hope for the best. And so now since life is mostly discrete, or at least a, a big chunk of it is discrete, um, then you're going to have to deal with the fact that discrete is harder. And um, I mean, to some extent, I'm stating a truism that, you know, uh, <laughs> doing math on discrete stuff brings all kinds of complications that you don't have in the continuous world. Um, 
On the other hand, I don't believe that you can reduce everything to the continuous world. Again, some part of biology is really continuous, but, but, but much is absolutely not like DNA. I mean, that's pretty obvious. And so, 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 so there, I think that there is a real dearth of techniques. And so, so we thought perhaps we would be able to, to use that, these arguments and discretize them and, and turn them in, into a discrete proof. And, and we couldn't do that. Uh, it doesn't mean it cannot be done. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, I hope somebody uh, can do that. Uh, but, and, and this would be fine, by the way. I would see nothing wrong with going into a continuous model of something, try to do some interesting math and powerful, using powerful techniques, and then transfer back. I mean, if, if this works, great. Uh, but it's not clear what, what this has to work. And I think there's something fundamental here we should not, I mean, it's not just discrete, it's not harder simply because that's just life. I mean, there's a good reason for it, uh, which is that um, the, the continuous modeling of physics relies on symmetries, on very, very, very powerful symmetries, which then gives you invariance. Uh, the whole Noetherian theory of how, you know, um, uh, the symmetries of physics to, uh, become uh, invariance. And um, in biology, you, you lose a lot of that, okay? And I mean, you do have symmetries of, of some kind, uh, but to some extent, symmetry is not the guiding principle of what makes the magic. What makes the magic of, 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 a, of a cell it, it, it is, not, is not driven by symmetry, whereas what's, what makes the magic of the solar system certainly is, is symmetry. This is really what, uh, what it's all about, is the beauty of symmetry that you see out, out in the sky. So there's a very big difference. If I have some time later, I will get back to it, but let me just move on. So this was my first love um, in the field of uh, natural algorithms, which is birds. Um, it's watching movies like this. Now, there are many movies like this, okay? And I'm sure you've seen them. And I'm still awed by what I see. And these are birds, uh, starlings, and how many they are. There are many of them. Uh, here, there'll probably be like 100,000, but sometimes there are more than a million of these guys and they fly together and they never collide. I mean, so I guess the birthday paradox does not apply for these animals. Uh, and now if you are into that line of work, everything is a question. Why are they doing this? Nobody knows. Um, how do they do it? So there are lots of models to try to figure this out. You could think that it's a gas, that's sort of, so maybe a Nagyscope uh, model. Um, or you can think it's an icing model. Some people have looked at this as a dynamic icing model and try to, I mean, in particular, the sort of question that you want to, to ask if you're a computer scientist is information. Like how much information propagates from one bird to the next? Uh, is it just local computation that produces a global phenomenon? Or, or there is actual broadcast of information across the entire system? I mean, there are tons and tons of questions. And um, I mean, there too, it's that these are obviously not a markup chain. I mean, it's obviously driven by energy. Uh, but so I just want to play this entire movie because there's the credit at the end. And I think the people who make these wonderful movies at least should be uh, acknowledged for providing these wonderful things. And um, in, in uh, you know, uh, YouTube, there are lots of things like this. Um, so now, now here's something pretty <laughs> interesting uh, I discovered early, which is that, uh, uh, well, people have thought about these problems way before I did. and. Um, in particular, Craig Reynolds, who, who's not known really for, well, he's done a little bit for his birds, uh, his voice, it's called, but, but he's really the father of uh, virtual reality, or at least he's considered by many as such. And, um, and so he said, oh no, well, so all this flocking business, there are really four, four rules. Birds don't like to be too close because they fly, so they don't like to collide. They, like, they love to be aligned with their neighbors. Uh, they like to fly to our neighbors, they don't want to sort of drift away, and they want to avoid occlusion. They don't like 
not to see where they're flying. Um, okay, so these, these formals make perfect sense. Uh, this is purely phenomenological. I mean, it's even worse than that. It's anthropomorphic. It's basically, you're, this rule is if you were a bird, that's pretty much what you would like to do. But, well, you're not a bird. So, uh, but here's the weird thing is that when you use these four rules, and this guy worked for Hollywood, and um, it actually works <laughs> in the following sense. So, so this is totally synthetic. What I'm showing you here is completely, Completely is the sort of thing that a Hollywood, you know, production would uh, uh, would do, and and then you can ask questions about the the Turing test. So you know, are you seeing real birds or are you seeing fake birds? And uh, I don't know. It could be fifty fifty. You know, it's uh, they clearly do a very good job, uh, but do they do a very good job? I mean, again, you know, if a bird could talk, then you should show this to the bird and see the reaction. Maybe the bird would say, you fool, I mean, humans, you're stupid. I mean, this is nothing like bird flying because we did not evolve to, to spot the exact, you know, flight formation of birds and stuff like that. So, so again, this anthropomorphic um, phenomenological modeling is something that to take with a huge grain of caution. But, but, but even without that, even if you believe in the model uh, entirely, and uh, so what? So you can make great movies, so that's, which is important, I guess. But if you want to do mathematics, it, th these four rules are not gonna help you very much because they're terribly difficult, okay? So, so what Vishak, Cooker, and Smale uh, did is to get rid of all of them, except for one. Uh, so they, they retain probably the one that should be retained. Um, uh, so now we have a model that's highly unrealistic, but maybe we, we can try to prove things. Uh, and again, there's been beautiful, these three people did beautiful work uh, on it, and many others, it's been uh, heavily studied. And uh, so actually that's what sucked me in uh, early, like 15 years ago, because I was really, I just thought the whole thing was totally fascinating. Um, and also, you know, when you don't know something, you tend to think it's that what you know is gonna help a lot. And then you realize that actually life is a bit more complicated than that. Um, so, but anyway, in this, you know, ridiculously oversimplified model, uh, a bird has a radius R and it's a, it's a little bit like the opinion dynamics basically, because it just looks at its neighbors. Um, and then it's got to adjust its velocity. So its opinion is, is its uh, velocity. It will adjust the velocity to, to the average of its uh, neighbors and it'll fly free. So it's similar to the opinion dynamics model, but there's a very big difference, which is that the position is the, inter, is the integral of the velocities. And so the network is defined by, by the position, not by the velocities. So in that sense, it's very different because the actual network, the flocking network, the, is determined by the position. And the position is the integral of the velocity. So, so in other words, the, the position inter, you know, is a summary of all the previous velocities. So that's why from a Markovian point of view, you have to think of velocity and, and position. Your phase space is velocity and position. So it's six numbers. Um, anyway, um, so I show actually, uh, I guess that's the first thing that I ever proved in this area that this graph eventually settles. Um, it, eventually it just, uh, well, there's only one graph and it never changes uh, after a long time. And, um, and so there, there was this uh, modeling and I don't want to go uh, into this too much, but you know, you recognize the in phase space, you have the velocity vector VN and the position, you know, lots of identities, but you have this averaging. So you average the velocities and then you add the velocities to provide the, uh, uh, the positions. So the, 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 so the whole thing, you know, this feedback loop, you update the network and you update the velocities and so on and up you go. Um, so what you could show is that there's a sort of pre-mixing time when the birds do almost anything they want. Uh, and then at some point, uh, they, they start merging into flocks. Okay, uh, this process can take a long time. And after that, they are in steady state. Now, a lot of geometry, um, I, I, I love geometry. And so 
I was happy that actually there was, uh, uh, that, well, obviously it's in geometry, it all lives in three dimensions. And so, and, um, but also what surprised me, I guess, is geometry is not very popular because um, when I started reading the literature, I noticed very quickly that the first thing these people do is to remove all the geometry. <laughs> and then they do algebra, they do all sorts of things and calculus, but uh, they seem to hate the whole concept of geometry. And so I was glad that I, I could restore a little bit of geometry where it belongs. Um, but still, there were lots of uh, very hard questions that I could not answer. But, um, but at least it gave me a chance to introduce this concept, the S energy, which I think uh, has potential or at least I could use it for this, but, and for other things uh, as well. And so let me quickly um, run over this uh, idea. So, so let's say that you have a sequence, let's say infinite, it doesn't have to be infinite, but let's say you have an infinite sequence of, of graphs. The, these are say undirected and they are, they consist of n vertices and these vertices are labeled. So these are the same vertices for all these graphs, one through n, okay? But G1, G2, G3 are graphs, and it could be different graphs. Um, I use lowercase for some reason, but we don't have to get into this. All right, so you, you, let's say you're given this. Uh, and um, now, think that you're doing a random walk. Let's say if you were doing a random walk, a, a, a temporal random walk would work in this sort of obvious way that you would start somewhere in G1 and then you would, you would take one random step and now you would look at G2 and take a random step in G2. Then you would look at G3 and uh, take a random step. Since, since all these graphs are sharing the same vertices, this is very consistent, uh, this thing, okay? So a standard random walk is just when there's only one graph, like G1, 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 okay? So that, that's your standard random walks, but the dynamic random walk, uh, these, uh, the, the, the edges can change. I mean, this has been studied for decades, uh, this concept. Um, now, algebraically, uh, let's look at the stochastic matrices, PI, uh, for each uh, random walk, for the random walk in G sub I. And now let's do, let's forget about probabilities. Actually, let's multiply these matrices together, but let's multiply them to the left, not to the right. I mean, if you were doing a random walk, you'd be multiplying from left to right, but here you're doing from right to left. Uh, and also you pre-multiplying by this vector X, which is not a probability distribution. It, it's just any vector in Rn. I scale it down to zero one, but it doesn't matter. Okay, and then you define the sequence. Uh, so X sub K is a vector of X numbers, uh, of uh, N numbers between zero and one. Okay, so think of, X sub K as the uh, vector of positions of uh, vertices. And so, in other words, X sub K uh, embeds uh, G sub K in uh, zero one, uh, or actually I shouldn't put the exponent M, it's just in, in the interval zero one. Okay, this is a typo. Okay, so uh, now let define L sub K as the length of the smallest interval cover. So, to, to make sure we understand what I'm saying here, let, let me draw a picture, okay, to explain what I mean. So say this is G sub K. So this is your graph with the red arrows. So these are the nodes, the vertices, and then the, um, and these, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the edges are these red things of the edges of the graph. And so it's embedded between zero and one. And so uh, you look at the connected, uh, Okay, no, I'm sorry. You simply look at uh, the, the smallest, um, you, you want to take a, a cover of all the nodes, okay, with the edges, or rather of all the edges with intervals. So you can use one interval from here to here and one interval from here to here, okay? So by using two intervals, you can cover all the edges, okay? And, and you do it the best way possible, which is as I showed. So this is of length 0 0.2, this is of length 0 0.3. So the total length is 0 0.5. So this number L sub five is equal to 0 0.5 because that's how much length of interval you need to cover all these red edges and all these red edges. Okay, okay. I hope I was not too confusing about this definition. 
I know it's a little weird because actually this has nothing to do with the connected components because these guys could overlap. So, but anyway, that's your definition. Okay. And now you define this, um, this infinite sum. Okay. The sum for all K from uh, one to infinity of this number L sub K raised to some power S and S is a number between zero and one typically. Okay. So this is like a moment generating function or something like that, or, um, Okay, anyway, so this parameter is very important here. Uh, this is a global quantity, but there's a parameter like a, so you, this is a Dirichlet, this is called a Dirichlet series. You, you can also interpret this as, as a partition function if you're a physicist and, and this would be the inverse temperature, but let me not get into this. Um, now, now this function, so we call the S energy, and there's a reason why it's called S energy. I don't want to get into this, but is, is, is actually surprisingly powerful. Um, so, I mean, as long as you can bound it. So what I showed, and there are several improvements because uh, it uh, didn't get the optimal result early on, but, but not so long ago, I actually proved this upper bound. And um, so let's just, just uh, go through it. That this number, even though it's an infinite series, uh, is bounded by three over rho s to the power n minus one. Now s, you know what it is, is this variable. Um, a row is the smallest non-zero matrix element. Now, um, as you notice, when S is zero, this is infinity, but that makes sense uh, because when S is zero, this is one, okay? So you're just sort of counting uh, one at every step. So of course, this is gonna be infinity. In fact, it's not obvious. I don't know any trivial argument why this quantity is ever finite. Okay, that for any value of S, this thing is finite. I don't know any trivial argument why that's the case. But anyway, this is the bound and this is tight. This is a tight bound. Now, when you put conditions on this graph, for example, you can suppose that there's a reversibility. So this is reversible Markov chain. And so you have some conditions, uh, then you get better bounds than that. Now, um, what are you gonna do with this thing? Uh, Where well, you can use this to bound the, convergence rate of lots of processes like this. Uh, now, to convince yourself that maybe this is not totally useless, uh, you can see what happens when all these matrices are the same. So when all the matrices are the same, then you have P to the power K. And so it's essentially a Markov chain. It's a standard random walk, okay? So this gives you something about random walks. And sure enough, you can rederive mixing bounds, uh, all mixing bounds, no of any Markov chains. I, I'm not sure why you would want to do that because it doesn't really give you any, anything simpler. Uh, but this is the sort of thing that will allow you to bound the mixing bound for a Markov chain. So in particular, this generalizes this to the case where your Markov chain is dynamic uh, changes. Okay, so now the interesting, from my point of view, at least, uh, the interesting th thing about the proof is that it's an algorithmic proof. Uh, and here's what I mean by this. Uh, in computer science, in, in the field of algorithms, we're all very used to this notion of using potential functions and we have credits and we share credits and so on. Now, people in dynamics do that also. They call that Lyapunov uh, functions. Uh, but, but what's done in computer science has more, is, has more expressibility um, because it's not just one number, but it's a whole, it's this whole economy that you, you can set up. And likewise, in, this, in the proof here, what you do is you define this banking system where pairs of agents have money, they have a banking account, and then you explain how they can trade and they can borrow and, and they have to pay back and they have to give. So there's this trade. So it's an algorithm actually. If this, then do this, if this, then do that. So the proof itself is an algorithm, is, is a trading algorithm. And then you look at, you know, how this algorithm, then you analyze the algorithm, the trading algorithm. You don't analyze this, these dynamics. You actually analyze the trading algorithm and, and then you prove uh, what you want to prove. Uh, now this is, these techniques are really inspired from, from the field of algorithms. They're not so common in dynamics. And so, I don't know, hopefully there will be some sort of meeting of minds and merging of these techniques um, uh, in the future. Uh, again, I think that there's a pretty good philosophical reason why 
some of the old techniques cannot work uh, when they are when there's so much diversity in the system, you know, when you have all these different agents and they can do whatever they want. Again, you just, um, you don't have the kind of democracy you have in physics. You know, in physics, all particles are the same, or maybe there are two species of particles, but you know, there, there are 10 to the 24 uh, copies of the same damn thing, uh, all subject to the same laws, exactly the same pressure, the same temperature, the same. Um, and that just simply is not true uh, in biology. There's a huge amount of diversity. You know, every molecule wants to do its own thing. Uh, and there are not so many copy numbers. I mean, the copy numbers tend to be small. It's not like it's Avogadro's number. Um, now, the last thing I will talk about um, is renormalization. That's what I've been mostly working on actually uh, lately. And um, the concept is kind of compelling. Uh, from a computer scientist, I think it's, it's kind of obvious. Uh, you have something complicated like all these birds. It'd be kind of nice to do dimensional reduction by seeing this flock as composed of subflocks. And so if that makes sense, then somehow you could replace the flock by a superbird. And now you have a flock of superbirds, which is much smaller than the previous one. And hopefully it has some of the same properties. Now, of course, in renormalization in statistical physics is, is, uh, is, is very common in, in quantum mechanics also. Uh, and also, I should say, in dynamical systems. Um, but um, so at least it is similar in spirit to this sort of a, approach, of course, grinding approach from statistical mechanics. Um, this is a picture that I just saw. It, 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 these are birds, but... <laughs> The flock looks like a bird. Okay, never mind. <laughs> it's just cute. Um, so anyway, so we look at um, what. So imagine, okay, imagine. Let's go back to our dynamic Markov chain thing. So, so you have this Markov chain. Imagine that the edges come and go over time. There's all the the, the weight changes, or all that uh, changes over time. How do you make sense of this? Now. When you take a, you know, any textbook on Markov chains, like the first chapter, it tells you how to classify uh, all the states of a Markov chain. And it's a, it's a very nice, simple, beautiful argument uh, that, that tells you how you, sh you should break up a Markov chain into irreducible components and so on and so forth. All right, can we do the same thing uh, when it's uh, the dynamic? Um, so that's what I'm trying to, um, so, how would you cluster a sequence of graphs hierarchically in a manner that is consistent with the dynamic random walk? Now, the second part is very important because if you ask somebody, how do you cluster a graph? Well, there are tons of ways, of wonderful ways of doing that. Now, you want a hierarchical cluster? Yeah, we know how to do that also. There are lots of great methods. Now, here we want to do the same thing, but it has to be semantically consistent with what we want to do. In other words, you have to ask the question, why are you doing this? Uh, if you do a random walk, you might cluster it in a certain way, but if you use the graph for a completely different purpose, uh, then perhaps the clustering is gonna be very different. So this is a sort of semantic renormalization, and I, I, I have this little picture I will illustrate this, it's kind of silly, but... Uh, um, so, but anyway, but before I get to the silliness, um, so this would be the, the idea, and so this is what I did in the case of random walks, but but only random walks, okay? So this is not the way any sequence of graphs should be clustered. It's just a particular case of random walks. And in the case of random walks, you have to think of like information trying to flow from edges to edges, and whether there's an edge or not, the information will flow or will not flow. So, so th th this renormalization has to capture uh, the moments when the water is stuck in some, some corner and when it flows and all, all of this propagation, propagation of the water, of the information across the system. That's really what uh, you're trying to capture. So if you have this sequence of graphs and you imagine doing the random walk, you know, first step over here, second step over here, third step over there, then you'd like to define some kind of grammar that expresses the, when some the information is stuck, when it's not stuck, when it can travel one way, maybe both ways, and so on and so forth. And then you simply would, would parse this sequence. So you would look at G1, G2, G3, 
uh, as letters in an alphabet, uh, and then or words, if you will, in a language, and then you would parse this as an infinite sentence. Okay, so that's what uh, was done. But now I want to get to the silliness because, um, again, I don't want to get into the technical aspect of how to do that. But how this semantic thing is so important. So let's go back to clustering. When you have like the way uh, page rank uh, clusters, graphs, and so on. So you have a graph and you have some basic intuitions that communities, you know, uh, should, should be together uh, in, in the cluster maybe. And, you know, so, so, you, so you have some, some metric or some parameter that will measure how well you're doing, you know, maybe some ratios of densities of this and that. And as you know, there are many ways you can do this. You can have a spectral approach, so global algebraic approach, or you could have combinatorial uh, approaches, just counting items, and you can have all sorts of different things. And then depending on the applications, and of course, there are many applications, this is a huge problem, then people will say, well, I think you're better off using this technique. And I think this technique there will work better for whatever reason. You know, usually that's the way it works, but somehow there's the sense that, that you have to look to some kind of nice metric. Maybe you should take your graph and embed it on a manifold or low dimensional manifold. And then on that, then the curvature or something will tell you something. Okay, great. So anyway, you, you're, you're looking for this. Uh, and then you do your uh, clustering. But to some extent, this is very syntactical, okay? You, you, you pay really little attention to actually what you want to do. Uh, and you just have a catalog of possible metrics and you pick the one uh, that works. So I want to move away from that. And I want to say that the way we cluster sequences on graphs, must be done in relation to why are we doing what we're doing. First of all, what is this graph? Why do you have a graph that's changing? Why is it changing? And not just the how, you know, how this edge is coming and going, but why are you doing this? So uh, maybe so the, the silly example is the case of a game, okay? So this is a game of soccer, but you could do, use your, your favorite game or whatever. And say so you want to cluster uh, the thing. Now, let me start with a proposition that you're a 10 year old kid, okay, who follows the premiership in England or something, or you're a coach, you, you will actually cluster this graph, you will renormalize it constantly. You don't even have to be taught how to do it and you will do it the right way. If you don't know, if you've never seen the game before, if you don't know the rules of the game, then you will have no idea what to do. I mean, so let's take this example. Okay. Well, I mean, you see they will have different jerseys. So one is red and one is white. Okay, so presumably this should influence the way you cluster things because all the red should be together and all the white to be together. Okay, right there, notice this has nothing to do with the geometry. It has nothing to do with the position. Uh, you know, if you draw a graph of who sees who at what distance, well, this has nothing to do with that because it's just the color of the damn jerseys, okay? Well, that's because the rules of soccer work that way, okay? Now, when you start playing, okay, then there's this thing called marking where, of course, you try to mark people in the sort of opposing camp. Uh, but that too may have very little to do with the actual distance. So this, this is not a Euclidean thing where you mark these people are running fast and they, they, they have different ways of marking. And uh, so, but still, if you are an expert watcher, then you know exactly what's going on. You know exactly why this player is here and this player is there. Uh, this clustering for you is completely natural because you know the rules, okay? My point is, it's the rules. It's not just looking at this, like a blank slate and somehow you're gonna say, ah, I know how to do that. And maybe you could train a system. Maybe you could have a, you know, a, some sort of clever uh, recurrent uh, neural net, which could just, just, just be tried over many and rediscover the rules of soccer. That's true. But to some extent that just proves my point that you actually have to know the rules. Like for example here, you know, these two people who are on the opposite side of the picture right here, 
actually, this is Barcelona, by the way, if you're interested, uh, you know, it's gonna pass the ball. So obviously they are clustered together because they communicate and the ball is gonna go from one to the other, even though they're really far apart. In fact, they are like the two players, the furthest apart, uh, just about, um, and so on. So I don't want to um, uh, expand, I mean, uh, go on too long. Plus, I think I've run out of time, no? Mishit, how am I doing? Yeah, I think uh, if you could conclude and then yeah, we can so I will, questions. So, yeah, so this is my last uh, slide, I think. Yeah, so yeah, so only I will conclude with uh, sort of, you know, out of equilibrium is very important. We need to develop techniques, uh, algorithmic techniques for uh, to try to uh, uh, understand this. Uh, and I will terminate with my little sermon on um, what makes biology different from, from physics. Um, now we know there's processing, you know, biochemistry just does a lot of processing, transforms things, it takes signals, it does this. So, so this processing is pretty clear. Communication plays a huge role because, you know, there's all these papers about why life could not exist in 2D, you know, 3D. I mean, the, the molecules have to come together, okay? And, um, and, the, and some should and some should not, and they should come at the right time. So communication is really integral part of processing. Some of, of the processing is there only in order to provide the right communication at the right time. So maybe like distributed computing, but, but, but unlike much of, much of computer science, uh, communication is truly at the heart of the biological uh, enterprise as well as processing. But ultimately I think what makes it the most different is the concept of memory. And by this, I mean, I mean this in a very expansive way. If you want to understand the solar system, you know, the, the beauty is that you just need to know where the planets are and how fast they go, maybe how heavy they are, okay. And that's it. You don't need to know what happened a million years ago or a billion years ago. You don't need to know what happened yesterday. You don't need to know anything. And you just have some rules, some laws, and then you just have to know what happens, you know, the sort of Markovian principle, you know, rules physics. This is fundamentally the opposite of evolution. Evolution is exactly the opposite. That history matters, and there's this selection through, you know, through history. Uh, but you cannot just simply say, well, there are five laws, and, and then just apply these laws and stir, and then you will have a human cell in your pipette. And um, so, in that sense, what I see here, processing, communication, and memory, this is very interesting because this has a name and it's called computer science, okay? And so I, I'm increasingly convinced uh, that, that algorithms is the proper language for, for uh, biology. And this is what I'm uh, working on and with uh, collaborators and it's great fun. Anyway, thank you so much for your attention. Really appreciate it.